The second in the series is something that we almost never see in art. It is a woman who is lying there having been raped, and I assumed murdered. It's called raped. It's Peasants War too. Um, that was another thing. Um, the upper classes could, if they felt like it, simply take any of the women of the peasant class, uh, use them as they wanted to, discard them. There was no penalty. And so she's showing that aspect of the life of the peasant. Um, it's a very unique picture. It is extremely rare and possibly completely unique to show rape as this kind of violation. Uh, we've seen the attempted seduction um, and sort of uh, rape by coercion with um, Judith Lester's proposition and uh, Artemisia Gentileschi's Susanna. So those both have the woman's point of view, but in this case the woman has actually been raped. Um, she's been left for dead, possibly is dead, we can't be sure, but probably dead. Um, there are lots of rapes in art. The rape of Europa, the rape of the Sabine women, the rape of this person, the rape of that person, the rape of the, the daughters of Lysippus. Um, these have been called heroic rapes. It's almost an oxymoron, um, but not. To women it's an oxymoron, evidently not uh, to uh, men historically. I think uh, today most men would, would feel the same way about it. Uh, when we're talking about these heroic rapes, we're talking about usually classical themes, the rape of the Sabine women. And I know when I first had to teach these things, I used to sort of give them little subtitles, or when I was a student, I would think about them, like the rape of the Sabine women was um, how the Romans got their brides. So it was softened. And of course, you know, many of them are, are mythological scenes. Um, but just the idea that, you know, that rape was something heroic, good, is pretty horrifying. And so this is a very unusual work of art. Uh, people probably would not want to display works showing rapes and rape victims in, in the actuality. And she has. Um, let's talk about the way she's created this. You can barely see the woman. Uh, she is strongly foreshortened. Um, this is a technique that goes back, I don't know how many of you know, Montaigne's Dead Christ, which is a uh, image of Christ lying um, after his death on the slab, um, the stone of unction. And you're seeing him essentially from the feet. And that strong foreshortening intensifies the emotion. Um, and so the same thing here, um, this, the strong foreshortening um, you know, makes you feel like you are at her feet, essentially, and, uh, and intensifies that feeling. It provides a kind of diagonal movement into the composition. Uh, obviously, there are horizontals in the landscape elements. Um, and really what we're seeing is you know, her, her legs pulled apart, um, and she's, she's, she's not some elegant, lovely, um, lady, she's, she's heavy set. Uh, she's got you know, thick legs, she's, she's somebody who works and now has been raped and killed. All around her are flowers, wilted flowers, which uh, you know, would obviously refer to uh, the violation. And um, I know one of my sources says this is the only time you see vegetation in any kind of, uh, in any of Colwitz's work. Uh, number three, the sharpening of the scythe. Uh, obviously the tool with which they would reap the grain, here changing it to be a weapon. And once again, she's not showing idealized figures. I mean, these are the peasants who have been abused uh, and 
you have this very close-up figure of a, a woman whom we would call homely. Uh, but no one has the right to oppress somebody because of their physical appearance, because of their social or economic status. And that's a lesson that we're learning. We still do not have a society that um, is perfect yet. And some people think we shouldn't, you know, and uh, might just say, blame the people who are uh, the victims. Um, and other people believe, as Kathy Colwitz obviously did, that uh, we should work for social justice. Um, this is probably the m most famous scene in the, this print, Outbreak, Los Brug, is probably the most famous image from the Peasants' War. It was the first one that was completed, and uh, it's number five in the series, and it's the one that has uh, some historical um, content to it, uh, as far as a specific event in the history of the Peasants' War, not just an imagined event. Um, let's look at the composition. Once again, she's using this strong diagonal, this crowd of people uh, forming a kind of triangular form that's just rushing uh, toward, to one side. And in the foreground, you have uh, a woman whom we see from the back with her arms raised. And this is the historical um, section. There was a woman whose name was Black Anna, is what they called her, uh, who was one of the peasants who was calling for the outbreak, calling for the rebellion. Uh, the idea that a woman could be a revolutionary was something uh, that evidently impressed uh, Colwitz, and she uses herself as the model for Black Anna. So that is uh, the historical reference. And as you can see, she serves in the, the image um, as a kind of, so she's the vertical element, she's leaning to one side, it's almost as though she's raised her hands and this has just let out all this surge of emotion and it comes into physical action. You know, uh, you know, they, they've taken everything they can take and they have nothing, nothing, more, to, nothing more to lose. I mean, they're starving, um, their children die, they're, Women are raped, there's, you know, what do you have to lose? And so there is this incredible uh, surging forth of the outbreak. Now, one of the things you'll notice is, I mentioned this before, that she starts out with uh, fairly detailed realism, very detailed realism, I should say, and as she develops, you can still extremely realistic elements here, and certainly she knows her anatomy and the structure of, of the face and the body. Um, but expressionist elements, elements that have a somewhat abstract quality, they may be realistic, but they still read almost as abstract elements. Black Anna, for example, you can see her as this dark shape. Uh, we're not seeing her face. We're just seeing the shape of her form. And we recognize her, of course, as a, a woman. But we could, also real, re, we could also see it as an abstract form. And uh, the gestures, for example, are strongly emotive. Uh, so expressionist elements uh, become stronger and stronger in her work. Number six in the series is uh, Schlachtfeld, Battlefield or we might just call it after the battle. Um, and there is, once again, a human form who here is, we just see the shape, is leaning over and searching among the dead for their loved ones. You know, you think battlefield, you think, oh, we should have some, you know, uh, you know heroic charge of the Scots Greys or something. Instead, she shows what the battlefield really means. It means the suffering of the living who have lost people in the battle. So this is presumably after one of those um, times when the, the um, 
I mean, the, but the poorly armed peasants, where they got rocks and, and scythes, uh, you know, are mowed down by the, uh, the troops of the Bishop of Würzburg, for one, but uh, of the other uh, ruling class. And the last one is just called Prisoners. And as you can see, uh, these are the survivors who have been rounded up. Uh, they're tied, they're within uh, a, an enclosure. And this has been used for other kind of prisoners, uh, whether you uh, agree with their cause or not. Uh, and of course, Kathy Colwitz wouldn't even know about their causes because she would have been dead. But these images uh, have been used for, uh, for example, the IRA um, protesting the incarceration without trial. Uh, and I have, I have no um, use for people who are violent, uh, particularly in societies where there are ways of protesting uh, without harming someone. Um, but as you can see, this could be a universal picture of, of prisoners, of any kind of prisoners, prisoners of conscience, um, whatever you want to use it for. So that's one of the things that's become so powerful about these. Uh, they are not just a, a, you know, a, a, a historical events. They are also things um, that have a universal significance. Outbreak was awarded uh, a prize, uh, the Villa Romana Prize, which uh, gave her a year in Florence at this villa. And uh, it does say something that you know her husband didn't say. No, you have to stay here and do housework. Uh, she yes, go off to Florence. <laughs> um, and uh, I was trying to find what years these were. I just found this statement that she taught for two years in the Women's School of Art. Um, she taught a master class in graphics, and her salary was supposed to be the equivalent of two hundred dollars a month. I'm not sure if that was two hundred dollars when the book was written or two hundred dollars. So back in 19 whatever it was. But the point is that this was the first time she really made any income from her, um, from her work. I mean, it's very nice to have a trip to Florence. It's very nice to have a gold medal. Um, but it's even a better thing to have a regular salary. Uh, so uh, she, this was one of the things I said. If she had been working on her own, could she have done all of these things unless she had uh, someone to help support her. And so her husband becomes a very real uh, support in uh, financial as well as uh, emotive uh, and uh, just the physical way of giving her the time to create the works of art. Um, and I find myself odd when I say giving her the time as though he has the right over her time, but this is how uh, I think very often people have felt and many, many, many people still feel is that uh, you know, the man has the right to the woman's time and anything that he allows her, he's supposed to be complimented for. Uh, evidently, uh, Carl Kolwitz was one of the good guys. <laughs> um, she also, she achieved a few firsts. Uh, she was the first woman professor at the Prussian Academy of Arts. And in uh, 1928, she became the first woman to head a department at the Prussian Academy of Arts, which was, of course, graphics, uh, printmaking. I wanted to point out some things about her work of art. We've been talking about the emotional quality of it. Uh, some of the things you want to look at. Um, one of the things that always uh, strikes me is how structured her work is. Even when she is at her most simplified, most abstract, most emotive, uh, there is this incredible structure. It's the structure of the face, the bones beneath the skin, as it were, the structure of the body, not just an idealized body, but how you know, people often are, uh, imperfect by uh, artistic and idealistic standards. Um, the, the gestures, which not only show so much, but create these compositions, which sometimes are very you know, surprising points of view. We've talked about this with a number of different artists, and this is certainly something um, that makes artists stand out, is when they come up with new compositions. Um, she uses stark white and black. 
Um, and of course, sometimes it's not really white because uh, you'll see different images here and sometimes the papers are not stark white. Sometimes the papers uh, may have a, a warm or a cool tint. They may be grayish or they may be beige or something. They're often reproduced in black and white. Uh, so you'll notice that there's a, a, a variation in the reproductions I had depending on where we, we got them. Um, one of the things that's so interesting is that she is a transition between real, her, her work is a transition between realism and expressionism. Uh, she's starting to work in a realistic vein that has so much emotion behind it and she moves toward, as I say, more abstract elements within her art. Um, her imagery is powerful, it's strong, it appeals to uh, you know, basic feelings of empathy and compassion. compassion. And as she's working, you will see more and more, whether you identify them as part of the figure or just as uh, abstract lines, the lines, the shapes, the shadows, all of that use uh, is strongly emotive. Um, she also does a series, I'm not going to show you this whole series, but I have a few works from it, um, about war, Krieg. And uh, this was done in the early 20s. Uh, this is the widow, um, several. Uh, images here you'll see of the widow who was left after the war. Uh, this woman is obviously um, devastated. She may be pregnant. Um, woodcut became a wonderful expression for Colwitz. And with woodcut, um, you, you can have these very stark, uh, simplified forms, and you're, you're using the grain of the wood as well. Um, I think it's a, a very powerful medium. Um, in Colwitz, as well as the structure of the forms, you have always that very powerful emotion. And it really appeals to the, the deepest part of human emotions. Um, you know, we suffer with, and that's what compassion means, co passio, to suffer with. We suffer with the person uh, portrayed. Her work uh, becomes bolder, uh, more simplified, a lot of those little details. Um, except for expressive details, um, are no longer shown. She's not showing the texture of the woman's garment or her um, individual strands of her hair. Everything is very bold and strong um, and just, you know, powerful. Uh, here we see the widow, too. This widow has died. She's probably starved to death. Um, She does uh, exhibit with radical and dissident groups like the New Successionists, uh, which she is the only woman, and she's the first woman juror. Oh. She's the only woman juror. Um, and as she w sees uh, you know, some of the work that other people are doing and everything, she also moves toward uh, this expressionist quality. She's often associated with German expressionism. Uh, in some ways, she's a precursor. Um, and then, of course, uh, she's, she's working also at the same time uh, as uh, some of the German Expressionists who become, uh, I think in many cases, much more abstract um, and cruder deliberately. Uh, I don't think there's much crudeness except for the cruelty of the subject in her work. Now, of course, we said she lived to 1945, so what happened during the Hitler Zeit? Zeit is time. Hitler, we know who that is. Um, so during the time when Hitler was in power, uh, this was a bad time for artists. Um, she lost her position. She was uh, forced to resign uh, from her uh, academic position. Her work was removed from museums. Presumably some of it was destroyed. Um, she and her husband were threatened with uh, a concentration camp. But by this time, she did have an international reputation. And basically, they said, rather than be sent to a concentration camp, they would commit suicide first, is what they decided. Uh, fortunately, it didn't come to this actually happening. There was enough international pressure or basically um, possibly just the, the idea that um, you know, she was well enough known 
that you couldn't just uh, take her anonymously to a concentration camp and kill her. Um, of course, there were the bombings. If you've ever seen uh, pictures of what Germany looked like after World War II, uh, the bombing, I don't, I, I, the, in um, the Historische Museum in Frankfurt, they have um, these, what can I call them? The, uh, they're not really dioramas because they're not in a little box. They're spread out on, on tables. Um, but essentially, they have built models of what Fra uh, Frankfurt looked like at different points in history. And one is, I think it's 1945. And there's one church tower sort of in ruins standing. I mean, just everything else is rubble. Um, and I, how do people live? Well, you know, we know how some people survived. They went into the subways, just like they did during the Blitz in, um, in London. And if there hadn't been a subway system, I just wonder how anyone could have lived. Well, of course, um, you know, these were going on all over um, Germany in World War II. Um, and they knew, of course, you know, Berlin was definitely a target. Uh, in fact, the Berlin Art Museum was bombed and uh, many works of art were destroyed. As, of course, in the Dresden firebombing, uh, many works were destroyed in, in Dresden. Um, I guess when you're killing people and When you're killing people, not too many people are worrying about killing the art, destroying the art too. Although there was a commission that uh, uh, the Allies that tried to keep them from destroying things like Chartres Cathedral, uh, which of course uh, the Nazis used as an ammo dump, uh, thinking maybe it wouldn't be bombed for just that reason. Uh, but you know, Germany was left in ruins, and uh, so people were evacuated, you know, people who didn't have to be in the major cities. And uh, Kollwitz was, uh, I think by this time her husband had died. Um, I'm not positive, I think he died in 1940, but I'm not absolutely sure of the date. But uh, at any rate, uh, she was evacuated from Berlin. Um, she, was, uh, she went to a small town in Dresden where she was the guest of the Prince of Saxony, Prince Ernest Heinrich of Saxony, um, at uh, Moritzburg. And uh, it's there that she died in 1945. Um, her apartment in Berlin was destroyed in the bombing, and uh, presumably um, many works of art as well. One of the great tragedies of her life um, is that she died before she saw the war end of World War II. Um, I've seen people say that it was just a few more weeks, and one person actually said it was eight days. Um, I suppose you know, exactly when did the war end is a question, but uh, the war was to end very shortly, and it would have been wonderful if she had known that, uh, because she was utterly opposed, as we'll see, to war. Uh, as just another kind of cruelty. Um, and we'll also say the very personal reasons why she felt that way as we look at some of her other artwork. <laughs>